My own um, engagement with, with uh, Jungian thought has focused, I, I suppose, uh, largely on my own research interest, is um, his theory of synchronicity or his concept of synchronicity, um, which is the, the idea that, uh, that uh, events can be connected not just through normal causes and effects, but, but also through um, parallel meaning. Um, a causal parallel paralleling meaning and uh, uh, so I've, I've done quite a bit of work in that area and I'm interested in it because of its um, it seems to represent a quite a radical challenge in a number of ways to um, just to the ways of connecting events thinking about events that are um, the basis of, of most of what goes on in, in Western thought, both scientifically and, uh, in fact, in, in many ways religiously as well. Um, so Jung himself called his, his, his concept of synchronicity one of the best ideas he'd ever had. He didn't unpack exactly what he meant by that when he said that in a, in a letter to somebody. Um, but I think he was particularly, uh, particularly interested in it. I mean, it... it as a concept, it, it introduces the idea of, uh, of the possibility of events being um, uncaused, um, events just, things just, just, just happening without having any um, prior cause. It uh, introduces the idea of the relativization of space and time in events, that events can, things can happen which uh, uh, seem to be related in some way to other events that happen remotely in either time or in space. Um, uh, in, in ways that seem to defy normal understandings of how causal connections work. Um, it seems to be able to connect psychic events with physical events um, in ways that, uh, again, are puzzling. Um, not just sort of, you know, I think to, to move my arm and my arm moves, but uh, I have a dream and, uh, and something that the content of that dream is closely paralleled by something which happens in a seemingly co completely unconnected way in, in the outer world. Um, so it seems to defy the, the normal ways in which one understands the relationship between um, psychic and, and physical um, happenings as well. And then there's the, the fact that what seems to connect these, um, these events is the meaning of them. Um, uh, and at some, in some way it seems the concept seems to suggest, or Jung seems to think it suggests, that, uh, that there is a, a dimension of meaning, if you like, that, uh, that is um, independent uh, of humans, or not fully dependent on humans, I should say, um, that there, and that this, this sort of objective meaning, he calls it objective meaning, self-subsistent meaning, transcendental meaning, he uses various terms for it when he describes it, but he suggests that, that um, synchronicity in some way points towards that. So any of those, um, uh, uh, those sort of points that I've just made about the uncaused nature of events, the, the sort of spatio-temporal relativization of events, the connect this sort of un, um, this, this puzzling um, matching of inner psychic and outer physical events and the, um, the, the possibility of there being this um, dimension of meaning that is relevant for humans but seems to transcend humans and not solely to stem from them. All of those, in, in, in various ways, challenge the, the mainstream assumptions of, of, uh, of, of Western science and, and, um, and, and much of Western religious thinking in ways that um, are, I think, quite, quite provocative and, uh, and worthy of investigation. derives this idea partly from uh, theoretical um, considerations, um, uh, partly from his researches into the history of ideas, um, religious ideas and, and, and pre-modern um, ideas and philosophies, um, but also from experiences of his patients and of himself. Um, uh, 
he, I mean, his, his, his own most celebrated example is the one of the, the patient who um, had come to him, um, he, uh, having been unsuccessfully um, uh, treated by a number of other therapists, um, and she had this problem of being very rationalistic, and uh, uh, he found it very difficult to get through to her uh, and to establish a connection, to a more feeling connection with her. Um, and during one of the sessions, she started describing a, a dream she'd had about uh, being given a precious jewel in the form of a, a scarab beetle, an, uh, an, the ancient Egyptian um, uh, motif of the scarab beetle. Um, and just at the moment when she was relating that dream, there was a tapping at the window, Jung, um, uh, opened the window, an insect flew in, he caught it, and uh, it was a scarabaeid beetle, um, uh, something very, the closest, he says, to the kind that you get uh, in that, uh, in his, his part of the world, to, to a scarab beetle. And he presented it to his patient, saying, here is your scarab beetle from your dream. And this event seemed to um, uh, do a number of things. One, it, uh, it, it sort of shook up the patient, you know, uh, in the sense that she had this rational view of the world where those sorts of things don't happen. And, uh, and here her dream, or a motif from her dream, seemed to sort of materialise in reality. And uh, it, um, the, there, was no, um, there was no way in which one event caused the other. Um, the detail of it, Jung thought, was beyond what would be like to happen just by chance. It was so specific. Um, it, uh, uh, it was experienced by her as, as meaningful in, in the sense that it, uh, it, uh, it shifted her, her therapy on. Um, and in looking at its, its, its meaning, Jung also points to its, the symbolism of the, the image that appeared. The scarab beetle is a, is a symbol of rebirth. And uh, the, um, in the ancient Egyptian mythology, and precisely what was going on in this event was a, um, was a, uh, a rebirth for the patient that she was sort of uh, her her former way of being very rationalistic was 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 sort of she was dying to that in some sense and being reborn with this sort of more open attitude towards the possibilities of what could happen in in reality um, and this was was beneficial for for her therapy young young says so those that those are the kinds of experiences that he related in in um, in, in clinical terms in fact he doesn't actually give a huge number of examples of, of synchronicities, which is why that one is continually referred to when one refers to his experiences, because he he he, um, well, he, he gives, has a number of examples, but he doesn't give, go into them in detail, doesn't explain the context in which they happened in sufficient detail to, to know how he's thinking about them in relation to his, his psychological model. Um, but that, that is, that's the one where he does. Um, but it, it, it also sort of points to a lot of other interesting features, I think, about the phenomenon of, of, of synchronicity, beyond what, what, he's, um, what he says him, himself about it in, in his brief descriptions of it, actually, in, in his essay on synchronicity. Because the, the scarab beetle itself is uncannily well chosen um, as an example of, of a synchronicity, because it's not only um, a symbol of rebirth in ancient Egypt. It's also a symbol of, of um, the god of creation, Kepra, um, uh, and the Kepra was was the god of creation, and the scarab um, was was considered to be this, the uh, the symbol for this god of creation because of its ability to emerge out of nothing. There was this sort of belief in among the ancient Egyptians that 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 uh, scarab beetles were born by some sort of self um, um, generative power out of balls of, of you know, out of dung and, and, and so on, just emerged from nowhere. And uh, you know, this is uncannily apt, I think, for for um, for uh, Jung's uh, concept of, of uh, a causal emergence.
equally critical of, um, of religion, partly because of its uh, the, the sort of rationalistic um, basis of, of much of religion, but also um, because of its focus on, or its lack of focus on experience, its focus on sort of on creedal, dogmatic um, assumptions and, and established beliefs, and, uh, and, and, and its lack of openness to genuine experience. That's one of the major factors in his own, um, his own uh, sort of psychology of religion, is the, the importance of the, the experiential, is, is, is the core of it, really. Um, and synchronistic experiences, um, for Jung, were characterised by numinosity, by, by, by numinousness, uh, this sort of sense of something sacred, something that, uh, that uh, seems to point beyond the, the, the sort of empirical framework or, and, and even the, the sort of, the, the sort of um, the, 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 what, what's sort of normal, easy to accommodate in a, in a, in a sort of an everyday picture of, of reality. It seems to point towards something, something else, some other um, dimension or, or order of reality, if you like. Um, uh, so, so it's it's a, f a form of religious experience, if you like, or it can be construed as a form of religious or spiritual experience um, that uh, cuts across um, a lot of the uh, assumptions about what you know what what religious experience would be or what religion how religion would be is is often understood. So the so synchronicity for Jung included distinctly sort of paranormal and uh, um, uh, uh, un un uncanny experiences um, uh, that, that would be of are often sort of viewed with suspicion by, by religions. And it's, it, the whole concept is also um, associated in Jung's mind with um, a tradition of religious thinking that has been uh, sort of marginalised um, in the history, the long history of, of Western religions. And so, I mean, in a nutshell, it's the, the, a sort of a pagan view that, that, that got marginalised um, in the d development, it's a very complicated story obviously, but got marginalised in the development of Christianity in, in the West um, uh, and survived and found various kinds of expressions in esoteric thinking of, of various descriptions and mystical thinking of various descriptions, um, much of which Jung is very interested in historically. Um, uh, so he sees synchronicity, or he describes synchronicity at one point as a, um, I think, a modern differentiation of the obsolete concept of correspondences, sympathy and harmony, as it were. In other words, the, the sort of esoteric worldview which sees um, the, based on the possibility of these kinds of connections, um, of um, uh, these sort of a-causal connections, correspondences, um, and uh, and if you look at the sort of the underlying theology of that sort of view, it's very different from the sort of theology that has dominated um, in in the development of Christianity, and also in the. Um, uh, development of enlightenment thought, which in some in many ways was a sort of has the same underlying structure as as as, as the, the thinking underlying Christianity um, uh, and under the monotheistic um, uh, theistic religions I would say. Synchronicity is a um, is is based on a, a, a or implies or associates itself with um, a, a, a a sort of metaphysical framework that is um, quite challenging to theistic the assumptions of theistic religions. I mean, I perhaps just very briefly, I'll try and say something about that without getting too tangled up. Um, uh, I mean, I think the, the idea that's sort of behind it is that um, uh, 
is that theistic religion, the, the religion that, that has predominated in, in, uh, um, in the Western theological tradition, sees a pretty essential distinction and separation between the divine and the world, um, a sort of necessary separation. Um, uh, that there's a, a sort of an ontological, fundamental ontological difference and separation, so that you know God creates the world, has no particular need to, doesn't need the world, but creates it out of this sort of um, sort of act of as a sort of gift or of you know, a, a, um, and so on. But the 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 world is is essentially separate, um, and that view, you know, there's there's a, there's a long and complex history, but uh, but that view in in the, the over the course of uh, the, the sort of centuries, you know, go through various forms. Um, but uh, to, as, as one approaches modernity, there are there are various attempts to to make that sense of the transcendence of God implied by that view purer and purer through the elimination of the, the sense of God's involvement in the world magically um, uh, and. Uh, uh, you know, so, so that in a, uh, you know, so that for example, in the in the sort of Enlightenment period, you get an, an increasing emphasis on a deistic form of religion where God doesn't intervene, having created the world, doesn't intervene in it anymore through miracles or anything. It just becomes purer and purer, more transcendent. And then eventually, um, uh, you get people like. Laplace, who, who say, you know, you no longer need this concept at all for your thinking about the world, but you're left with a world that has had the, the sort of divine separated off from it, um, and it's a, a sort of a, a mechanical world in a nutshell. Um, and this leads to the problems that Weber discusses under the rubric of disenchantment. Um, the, the alternative tradition, um, if you like, of, or another way of, another kind of um, theological tradition is the one where that separation doesn't happen. And it needn't be necessary, I mean, a sort of pagan view where the divine is considered to totally infuse or interfuse with, totally be, to cohere with the, um, the uh, world. Um, uh, so that the world, in a sense, is um, itself divine um, and uh, and that, 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 that tradition um, is, is one that you know has a variety of forms but there isn't this this sort of separation between um, uh, God and the world and uh, uh, and this is what the, the, the sort of tradition that um, uh, stemming from sort of a variety of pagan thought that, that informs a lot of the mystical thought um, it's a sort of a, a, a sort of return to that or a rediscovery of that and, and also a lot of esoteric thought which presupposes that there is this um, there, that uh, the, the world that we experience is the, the phenomena that we experience as it were are signs of or, we, or one can read through to the operation of this of, of, of the divine or indeed that, that they are themselves divine and that there is this, this pattern of correspondences. Synchronicity then is is that it, it sort of prompts one to rethink the underlying metaphysics and and um, uh, theology, if you like, um, of uh, Jungian psychology. And of course, when uh, when talking and and thinking about Jung, one has to be very careful in using the term metaphysics because Jung himself disavowed metaphysics. He he. he he continually said he's not a metaphysician, he's not a philosopher, um, and he doesn't want to be viewed in, in that light. And I think one has to take that with a, with a pinch of salt, in a sense, um, or one has to be, understand where he's coming from and why he's saying that. Um, uh, because I think it's important, that's one of the important things I think that's, that's happening in a lot of um, thought about Jung's work today, is, um, is a recovery of 
um, a sort of willingness to think metaphysically about his thought or to try and identify what, what, what the metaphysics is in his thought. Because um, Jung, well, although Jung disavowed it, in a sense, um, he had his reasons for doing that, and partly they were pragmatic in the sense that at the time he was working, psychology was just differentiating itself from other disciplines, um, philosophy and physiology and, and other disciplines. And he wanted not to be seen to be doing philosophy. He wanted not to be seen to be doing theology, or, or he wanted to sort of assert the distinctiveness of his own discipline. So he didn't want to be seen to be speculating about things that were not um, within his observational sort of view, as it were. Um, so, so there was a sort of pragmatic view of, you know, establishing the disciplines of, of the boundaries of his discipline. Um, then I think there was, uh, I think one has to uh, note that, that he is himself happy to be critical of views as metaphysical when it suits him. For example, he's happy to call, when people are um, reductively materialistic in a way that he doesn't like, he's, he's willing to say that they're no less, um, that's no less a metaphysical position than people who are being uh, uh, talking about theological issues about God or whatever. Um, and, and, but by the same count, his own view, his own um, uh, approach where he f tries to prioritise the psyche and psychic experience is also a metaphysical view and, um, and one just has to acknowledge that <laughs> and start you know, exploring what sort of metaphysical view is it and how can you best articulate it and, and so on. And I think he, he, it would have been better if he, for him if he'd acknowledged that and, and done more uh, metaphysical thinking. I think also he had a, he had a rather uh, negative view of metaphysics as a sort of an empty theorising about stuff you couldn't possibly know, you know, that just sort of in, just in wild speculation, um, uh, totally ungrounded. Um, but, but in a sense, that's not necessarily a fair view of metaphysics. Um, I mean, the, I mean, going right back to Plato. I mean, Plato's uh, has uh, uh, Socrates talk about um, when when they're talking about the forms, and the forms are. The, the Platonic ideas, the Platonic forms are, they're, they're postulated as hypotheses in order to explain phenomena better than other uh, theories. So they're, and, and Socrates slash Plato are willing to reject the idea in principle anyway if they don't explain as well as something else. But so so they, they, they're, 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 they're hypotheses. Um, this is part of Plato's hypothetical method, if you like, which, which, is, um, which is used. And uh, so how well do they explain the phenomena? Um, that, that, that we do agree about. And, uh, and if, more and more recently, to, or closer to Young's time, uh, something like um, Charles Sanders Peirce uh, talked about abduction as a, as a sort of method, didn't he? And, uh, and uh, the, uh, the, the view that, um, that, uh, that you, as it were, um, in make an inference, or perhaps it would be better to say an intuition, to uh, a view uh, which then which doesn't derive by induction or deduction from from your experience, but you make this kind of leap, this sort of um, this sort of uh, take this step to postulate a view of reality, and then you see how well it fits with with, with the phenomena. It's the best explanation of the phenomena. So inference to the best explanation is one way in which you can characterise that. And if you see metaphysics in that light. Um, uh, this is what Jung is, is, is doing, um, or, or what he is doing and, and, and what he can acknowledge doing and might have done better if he'd been more reflective about that rather than continually hedging around and, and claiming he wasn't doing metaphysics. statement that Jung makes in, um, in an interview with Mertje Eliade, 
um, in 1952, uh, where um, he talks about um, the numinous as being the core of religious experience and as being characterised by um, the relativization of time, space, and causality. And then he says that, that Jung says that um, you know that he's been working recently on a concept. Um, uh, that, that explores that, namely the concept of synchronicity. Um, so I think that's very interesting that, that he's there um, saying that synchronicity, in a sense the structure of synchronicity, what's implied conceptually in the notion of synchronicity, is at the heart of numinous experiences. Theoretical account, if you like, of, of, of synchronicity, he talks about how all the experiences of synchronicity that, that he uh, is aware of, that he's had, he thinks can be shown to be underlying, to, to have underlying them a, um, uh, an archetypal experience. And that an archetypal experiences for Jung are characterised, among other things, by their numinosity, by this, this, um, this um, very powerful, non-rational, affective charge that seems to bespeak a kind of otherness. Um, uh, uh, um, so, so you would expect synchronistic experiences as um, expressions of arch arch an archetypal order, if you like, to have the quality of numinousness. So, uh, and I think that's one of the the um, one of the factors that that one continually encounters, and what is so so charged about them. In fact, I mean, to go back to Robert Aziz, I mean, he, in his work, he gives a very helpful, I think, um, dis discussion of um, what constitutes the meaning of synchronicities, and he identifies four levels. The first is just the basic paralleling of content between the two coinciding events, you know, that they have the same or similar or comparable meaning um, of content, if you like, so that you can recognise them as... as essentially expressing the same idea in some way. Um, so that's a sort of paralleling. His second one is, is numinosity, a sort of pre-reflective, non-rational, emotional charge that the um, experiences have, which gives you a sort of a visceral sense of them being meaningful, profound, significant in some way. Then he talks about what he calls the, the subjective level of meaning, which is um, uh, how this connects as opposed to one's own um, uh, interests and needs and de psychological development in, in, in terms of Jungian psychology, I suppose, how it promotes one's ongoing um, development of one's personality, one's individuation. Um, so this is the, th the sort of subjective level. And then he talks about a fourth level of meaning, the objective level, which is, he also calls the archetypal, which is sort of identifying what archetypal pattern or theme seems to be being expressed within that synchronistic event regardless of whether it is um, uh, regardless of whether it's um, you know aiding and abetting one's own individuation I mean not that the, the, the two are in, a, in any way um, in necessarily incompatible it, you know the, 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 it can be expressing the archetypal meaning and that can be sort of facilitating one's, uh, one's uh, individuation. Um, so, he, so in that sort of model, numinosity is one central and very key part of, of the, the meaning, the sort of pre-reflective um, emotional charge that these experiences of synchronicity can have. But of course all of those, so even though as he only calls the final one um, archetypal, they're all grounded in the archetype, in the sense that it's by dint of the archetype that the parallel content is parallel because it's the archetype that's, that's in some way express, finding manifest expression in these different psychic and physical contexts. The numinosity is, is, um, is a characteristic of the archetype and the promotion of individuation is something, again, you know, that is a sort of an archetypal process, a process grounded in, in Jung's understanding of, of archetypal process. So the archetype is at the root of it all for Jung um, and hence the whole thing has this sort of numinous characteristic.